and uh, you know the sandbox was pretty cool for my kids. This is actually a mile outside of Riyadh. It looks uh, remarkably like Utah. It's called an area called the Red Sands. And then one day I said to my wife, you know, we have this offer to go to Saudi Arabia, and she kind of looks at me like, what are you out of your mind? I, from you know, uh, political conservatism to political conservatism, prohibitions on alcohol, um, you know, social conservatism, and you know, what's with this polygamy stuff? I said, no, no, seriously, it should be great. The desert blooms are much more beautiful. This is the view out my front door. Actually, when we first moved uh, to Utah, you can see there, there are no houses there, but in the wintertime, by the wintertime, there have been many more. Backyard, lots of snow. Front yard, I, back, I'm, I mean, uh, backyard here in the springtime, just to let you know that everything changes, nothing's permanent, and that's just the way life is. Uh, stuff we like to do in Utah, I uh, ski. Uh, there used to be a day when um, I used to say, follow me guys, and it was no problem. We get a lot of deep pow. Uh, it's my son crossing eights up there, um, and one of my other sons getting buried below. Um, but follow me dad is now the most dangerous, you know, a phrase on the slopes because I could never follow my boys these days because they don't keep their skis on the ground. If you're interested in an entertaining video clip, uh, check out When Reindeer Attack on YouTube. My, one of my sons used to be a competitive longboarder and he had a collision with a deer going about 50 miles an hour. Both survived. Uh, my daughters are into competitive horse riding, I like to get air. And in the summertime, uh, my son and I like to go surfing, particularly down in Baja, California. My wife actually picked me up on our first date on a motorcycle. I couldn't believe it. And there in the middle uh, picture is her on a, a dirt, on a dirt bike in Saudi Arabia with an abaya on and no helmet. Don't recommend either of those things on a motorcycle. <laughs> but our children have kind of grown and thrived. We have a large kind of extended family, as you can see. And you can see that in the bottom uh, frames, there are ex-fellows and uh, um, people that you may uh, notice. And uh, our house is kind of uh, open to all of you. And hopefully we will have you guys visit us at some point in time and uh, become part of our family. So the people that are living at home now are my daughter Sophia and the dogs. We're still crazy after all these years and doing okay. So here we, so you know a little bit about me. Um, I, now we'll get into a little bit of uveitis. Um, uveitis uh, really, um, you know, defines intraocular inflammation. Uh, it is not one disease, but really about 30 separate disease entities with specific clinical features, courses, prognoses, and disease-specific indications for treatment. Um, they, one can think of them broadly as infectious or non-infectious or um, masquerade syndromes. The non-infectious ones are thought to be auto-inflammatory or autoimmune. And there's real, no real etiologic diagnosis other than in infectious or Mendelian genetic diseases. It is, a, it is a leading cause of visual morbidity in the world, and about 10% of blindness in the United States is caused by uveitis, being fifth to sixth uh, to visual loss after diabetes and age-related macular degeneration, the impact of which may be even more severe as the peak onset is between the ages of 30 and 40 during the you know, peak economic productivity uh, of patients uh, with potential greater uh, visual loss than uh, age-related diseases. When we approach patients with uveitis, it's unfortunately, I know you went into ophthalmology to get away from, you know, round the continual rounding of medicine, but it is more like uh, internal medicine. And that is that the history, the ophthalmic medical and review of systems is critically important in helping us guide our diagnosis and treatment. So as Sir William Osler said, listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. And I can't tell you how many times this has been true. So we begin with an ocular examination then a general medical examination to the extent that we can perform it in the clinic. Sometimes you're looking at the skin and then joints can be actually very informative. And then we form the differential diagnosis, which is the keystone really to diagnosis in uveitis. So the differential diagnosis is made by characterizing inflammation along several different dimensions. One is the anatomic location of the inflammation in the eye, which we'll discuss. The presentation, that is, it is acute, monophasic, recurrent, or chronic, the course and its laterality, the lesion morphology location, the number of lesions and descriptors are important. Is it located in the retina or is it in the choroid? 
Um, then systemic and host factors are extremely important. Is this a uh, part of a systemic non-infectious disease such as sarcoidosis or Bechet's disease? Or is this part of a systemic infectious condition like syphilis or herpes or toxoplasmosis? And then of course, the immune competence of the patient is extremely important because characteristic morphology of lesions uh, in the eye look completely different. And all bets are off in terms of a diagnosis by pattern recognition when a patient is immunocompromised either iatrogenically or by disease. Then of course, the demographics, where in the world the patient is from is important as certain diseases are more prevalent in certain populations. The associated signs, uh, such as uh, we, what you can see in the panels to the right here, the, uh, the uh, targetoid rash of erythema migrans, which itself would be diagnosis, diagnostic of Lyme disease, or the woman up top with poliosis and vitiligo, which is associated with BKH disease. Um, a laboratory uh, investigation is launched based on the history and the differential diagnosis. Okay? And the, uh, the importance of the laboratory, as we will discuss uh, in, the, in a couple of minutes, is to exclude infection, identify uh, entities that can impact the systemic health of the patient, and provide prognostic information for the patient. And then one forms a treatment plan. Certainly you want to treat an infection with antimicrobial therapy, and then treat inflammation uh, or non-infectious uveitis with a step ladder algorithm employing steroids and then immunomodulatory therapy in an ascending manner, assessing the treatment effect and monitoring the side effects and toxicity. The standardization of uveitis nomenclature or the SUN working group uh, agreed to agree on what they're talking about in a workshop uh, in classifying uveitis. And one of the classification systems that they we agreed on was an anatomic basis, and that is to divide uveitis as to where in the eye the predominance of the inflammation is. So anterior uveitis is predominantly in the anterior chamber. Intermediate uveitis is centered in the vitreous and characterized by vitritis. Posterior uveitis includes inflammation in the retina and the choroid. And panuveitis is in inflammation in which all three compartments are affected uh, equally. So here we have some Examples of anterior uveitis and hypopion uveitis. Intermediate uveitis, the slip beam showing uh, active vitreous cell in the anterior vitreous. Uh, in the bottom left, a satellite lesion of retinochoroiditis associated with toxoplasmosis. And then in the bottom, a serous retinal detachment um, associated with VKH disease. Um, one uh, classification system that I think is useful to think of that was not included in your reading and in the uh, uh, sun classification is kind of an expanded classification system, which you might keep in your mind. And that is um, keratouveitis um, is herpetic until proven otherwise. Okay, as you can see in the slide up to the right with the sectoral iris atrophy. Scleroveitis, uh, scleritis is frequently associated with intraocular inflammation and can be a harbinger in about half the time of important systemic diseases. And then retinal vasculitis is a real mess in terms of classification uh, in that uh, the Sun group did not come to a consensus on what they mean, but one can uh, talk about retinal vasculitis as being either a primary idiopathic vasculitis or more commonly a secondary vasculitis either associated with a systemic disease or much less commonly uh, with a with a intraocular infection rather, or a um, uh, or systemic disease, or much less commonly with a systemic vasculitis, we can categorize vasculitis as to whether or not the arteries or the veins or both are involved. As this has helpful uh, differential diagnostic um, meaning, uh, and then the distribution of the vasculitis, which is really the subject of a, another lecture. Then. There's a lot of confusion as to what we mean when we talk about acute chronic or recurrent disease. Um, when we talk about the onset of disease, we talk about uh, it as being either sudden or insidious, um, the duration being limited or persistent, and three months being the arbitrary cutoff uh, for, for that. So that an acute uveitis would be of sudden onset and limited duration, whereas a recurrent UVIS would be one that has episodes that are marked by recurrence of inflammation 
of three months inactive off of treatment, whereas chronic disease has persistent inflammation, which uh, promptly relapses off of treatment. One can, one older classification system was whether or not it's granulomatous or non-granulomatous. This is a purely clinical description, not a pathologic description. Uh, many diseases have non-granulomatous inflammation and is not specifically helpful differentially, whereas granulomatous disease is a little bit more um, helpful. You can see these mutton fat stuck on KP on the left and then uh, a iris granuloma on the right. And the diseases that are more frequently associated with granulomatous inflammation are included in this slide, including sarcoidosis and lens-induced uveitis, TB, MS, and then of course herpes and, uh, and syphilis, which can do anything it likes. This is a very busy slide, and I think the takeaway from this slide is on the left-hand column, you have the anatomic location, anterior to panuveitis on the top, infectious systemic and non systemic diseases, and highlighted in, uh, in uh, red and um, uh, uh, yellow, uh, and in um, whatever that other color is, uh, are syphilis, Lyme, tuberculosis, and sarcoidosis. And the point is that those entities can do anything they damn well please. So they can be in any anatomic location of the eye. So one always needs to think about those particular entities in the differential diagnosis. So here we have a list of the major uh, differential diagnostic entities associated with anterior uveitis. So you have infectious disease, as you can see here in a patient with classic sectoral iris atrophy, which can occur in both um, uh, herpes type one and zoster. Here you have hypopion uveitis uh, that can be associated with B27 or Bechet's disease. Here you have a, a white quiet eye uh, that, uh, is associated frequently with JA-associated iridocyclitis and cataract, probably from uh, chronic steroid use. Uh, this is granulomatous uh, KP with posterior sneakia, as you can see, in a patient with sarcoidosis. And this is a patient with Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis or Fuchs uveitis syndrome. These are the major differential entities in intermediate uveitis. This is a, a cartoon of intermediate uveitis showing on the bottom and inferior what we call a snowbank, which is an accumulation of collagen and inflammatory debris, which is gravitationally dependent, and white, whitish uh, accumulations of inflammatory debris on the surface of the retina. A frequent complication of intermediate uveitis, you can see here is, angio is macular edema represented by this petaloid uh, leakage in the macula. And, uh, what are termed snowballs, which are actually inflammatory infiltrates that you can see here in a patient with intermediate uveitis. You will notice that these infiltrates are fuzzy, ill-defined, uh, and uh, not well circumscribed, denoting act active inflammation, whereas some eyes will have these types of um, snowballs that are well-defined, well-delineated, and are not characteristic of uh, active disease. And we'll see that in the clinic. Uh, and it's um, something that you will appreciate uh, on clinical examination. Then retinal vasculitis, uh, periphlebitis is extremely common in patients with, for example, MS-associated disease. Um, and one can appreciate uh, the extent of vasculitis even more uh, subtly uh, and, and with more accuracy these days with wide field imaging. Um, this uh, particular patient had a fairly benign looking uh, fundus exam with no, with no sheathing, as you might have seen on this ex examination uh, in clinic. Uh, so this is a typical ferning type pattern, which would be indicative of active, active disease and in a symptomatic patient uh, and in non-symptomatic patient needs to be treated. Uh, posterior uveitis, it is important to uh, understand and describe uh, the primary level of inflammation, whether or not the disease is primarily located in the retina, such as in the top panel with toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, or um, something that is um, uh, multifocal, as you see in the bottom, which is uh, a uh, multifocal choroiditis associated with tuberculosis, which is uh, located in, in the choroid. 
then the color, size, and shape of the lesions are also helpful descriptors and help you in the diagnosis. So here, for example, we have an amoeboid or helicoid uh, lesion emanating from the optic nerve, which is characteristic of serpiginous choroiditis. This example are placoid lesions at the level of the pigment epithelium, mostly occurring in the posterior pole, which is uh, typical of a patient with AMPI. The, these are yellow, orange, ovoid lesions, uh, predominantly seen in the posterior pole and nasal retina, as one sees in the, and their choroidal lesions as seen in Burchard retinochoroidopathy. These are more punched out uh, lesions uh, associated with multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis. A, a very similar picture can also be seen in patients with histoplasmosis associated disease. This is a little bit more difficult to see, but one uh, can see these evanescent white dots surrounding the uh, fovea and a granular looking macula in a patient with multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. Here is a list of the major infectious uh, entities. The most common infectious posterior uveitis is toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, which we'll discuss a little bit more in detail later. But this is in, in, in an immunocompromised patient is characteristic of a patient with CMV retinitis. This is a non-infectious entity, uh, uh, sarcoidosis, which has inflammation in the vitreous, in the retina, in the choroid, and the blood vessels. And in this particular patient, this is brown, as I remember the name, uh, in the anterior chamber. So this would be a pan -uveitis. And this was a most unusual patient with a uh, kind of a cross between ampi and serpiginous, so-called relentless placoid, multifocal choroiditis, part of the spectrum of so-called white dot syndromes, which again, will be the subject of another lecture at some point in time. So these are the major entities. And then there's pan -uveitis. So pan -uveitis affecting all three chambers. Um, always think about syphilis, BKH, Bechet's sarcoidosis, and of course, sympathetic ophthalmia. And this particular example is one of syphilitic uh, choroiditis. This is an example of a patient uh, that I saw in Saudi Arabia. You can see that they have stria in their retina and a very dull reflex and on fluorescein angiography, uh, pinpoint areas of uh, leakage and pooling in the retina, which is characteristic of uh, exudative retinal detachment associated with BKH syndrome. And this is a patient with, uh, a, with, an end, with sympathetic ophthalmia with an entity which is almost identical pathologically to BKH. So here we now have a language which we can kind of talk to one another um, about uh, when we're discussing uh, patients in the clinic or on the phone so that if you describe to me a patient with unilateral alternating relapsing anterior uveitis, the first thing that's going to come to my mind is an HLA B27 associated disease. Whereas if you say I've got this patient with a unilateral focal uh, retinitis uh, and vitritis, um, I might, the first thing I might think about is toxoplasmosis. Um, I, 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 an acute uh, peripheral multifocal retinitis, I'd be thinking about an infectious disease with uh, necrotizing retinitis. Uh, whereas acute multifocal retinitis has a very much larger differential diagnosis, uh, including the white dot syndromes. So you can see that once we agree to agree on what we're talking about, we can actually communicate with each other in a much more effective fashion. So since we're in the uh, business of vision uh, in ophthalmology, uh, we, uh, the clinical assessment, of course, involves uh, visual acuity, intraocular pressure, and then how, and then some type of system for grading inflammation. So again, the sun working system uh, didn't really come up with, but actually um, agreed to utilize the following uh, system of grading anterior chamber cells. There were several different systems that were in use at the time. Uh, and that the actually number of cells in the anterior chamber on a one by one millimeter slit is counted from, and is graded from zero to four plus. Um, and there is actually pretty good inter-observer uh, variability by one grade. Um, likewise, anterior chamber flare, which uh, represents leakage of protein from compromised vessels, is also graded uh, on a scale of zero to four plus, depending upon the degree to which the flare, uh, as you can, the analogy being this moisture in this, after a rain in, in this forest, obscures the, um, uh, 
the landmarks, the anatomic landmarks in the uh, anterior chamber. Vitreous haze is a little bit more complicated and there is no really good um, classification system yet that we have for vitreous haze, although um, many people are working on one that is based on OCT. This is what we currently use, which is the NEI uh, grading system, which grades vitreous haze on, on, a, on a grading score of zero to trace to one to four plus, depending upon the degree to which it obscures the major structures in the posterior segment. Obviously, media opacity will confound this, um, this grading system. And then another item for in which the uh, Sun working uh, system, uh, working group could not reach consensus was on vitreous cell scoring. Again, uh, this may be uh, um, addressed by OCT in the future, but um, it's kind of absurd to count, uh, you know, 50 to 100 cells as two plus vitreous cell, but nevertheless, people do grade vitreous cell and to get an idea of uh, vitreous cellular activity. Um, I think that there, it, it requires a certain amount of experience and seeing a couple of patients with this, but one, one will see that if you have an active retinal, retinal lesion, particularly a retinal choroidal lesion like toxoplasmosis, not infrequently, you will see vitreous cells over the inflamed area. Likewise, in patients with anterior uveitis, I'm sorry, a very severe anterior uveitis or intermediate uveitis, one can see vitreous cells um, in the uh, gel of the eye. Um, judging whether or not these cells are active or not requires a certain amount of uh, finesse and experience. There are lacunae or clear spaces in the vitreous gel um, that frequently form in patients with, uh, with uveitis and cellular activity within those lacunae would be more indicative of cellular activity because patients with chronic inflammation will have cells and pigment that are stuck onto the vitreous fibrils, which not, do not necessarily denote activity. Likewise, um, snowballs or collections of inflammatory infiltrates that have fuzzy borders uh, rather than well demarcated borders would be indicative of uh, vitreous uh, cellular activity. So we touched on this, the importance of a uveitis workup is really to exclude an infection. You don't want to treat an infection with um, a steroid you want to identify systemic diseases impacting health, such as B27 associated disease or sarcoidosis, guide appropriate treatment, and then provide prognostic information, information for the patient. So there's a difference, for example, between telling a patient they have a HLA B27 associated anterior uveitis and a patient that has birdshot retinal cordopathy because the prognosis and the treatment for each of those is vastly different um, one requiring um, just topical steroids, which usually gets better with one attack per year on average with B27 associated disease, whereas uh, Birchard retinal cordopathy really needs to be treated if the patient is symptomatic and has disease that's active at the outset with steroids and immunomodulatory therapy with a commitment to therapy for at least two years. So the workup should be selective based on the history uh, and the working differential diagnosis. Um, it should be staged, proceeding from the more common to the rare. Always consider syphilis, sarcoid, and tuberculosis in your differential diagnosis. That is considered, but not necessarily always order uh, tests for Lyme disease and non-endemic endemic area or TB. And then consider math grade syndromes in your differential diagnosis. Always have that in the back of your mind because you can be fooled sometimes. You may be dealing with actually a neoplastic process that looks like it's inflammation in the eye. Um, if there was one test that I had to order for, uh, to, um, for uveitis, it would be serological tests for syphilis, which we can talk about a little bit more detail, both an RPR and a VDRL, but nowadays there uh, is a reverse sequence uh, algorithm employing enzyme immunoassays, which are more uh, sensitive, uh, followed by uh, RPR for confirmation of the diagnosis, and then a, a TPPA, treponemal uh, collagen particle agglutination test as a tiebreaker, which confirms the diagnosis of syphilis. Lyme, I've never diagnosed a case of Lyme disease in Utah, although my colleagues that, you know, in Indiana and in New York and in, uh, in uh, New England do make this diagnosis not infrequent. So where you are and the prevalence of the disease in the population is important. 
So we have, you know, PPD and quantiferrin goals, which are good screening tests for patients uh, with, uh, for tuberculosis. Okay, so they have a reasonable sensitivity and specificity, but the problem is that the incidence, or the prevalence rather, of the disease in the general population is low, and so the positive predictive value of uh, this test is, is poor, so that one would not routinely order a PPD on every single patient with uveitis, but rather one might order a PPD in diseases in which you think that it might be more likely, um, such as uh, patients that present with choroidal tuberculomas seen here, or Eels disease, or pigeons choroiditis, um, or patients that have significant exposure risks are those people in whom you are considering placing on immunomodulatory therapy or an anti-TNF therapy, because that would, is mandatory to uh, exclude that diagnosis as you could make a latent tuberculosis pulmonary. There are other tests that are reasonable to get as, in a targeted fashion based upon your examination. For example, a patient with a uh, swollen optic nerve and a macular star, one wants to, would consider neuroretinitis. The differential diagnosis for that is long, but the most common cause is an infectious agent caused by Bartonella hensleyae or Quintana. In the, in the uh, fall, West Nile virus makes its appearance uh, from New York to California, and we've had several patients uh, with West Nile disease. So if you see a patient with typical targetoid lesions of West Nile, particularly a patient with diabetes or a patient with any signs of an encephalitis, you may be uh, the person to make that uh, diagnosis. Um, PCR of the aqueous or vitreous is uh, extremely helpful in the confirmatory diagnosis of necrotizing retinitis uh, due to herpetic disease, as you'll see. The routine screening of the serum is of really limited value, for example, for, for BZB and HSV or Toxo is, you know, they're so prevalent in the general population, so it really doesn't um, give you any, a positive test doesn't really give you any useful information. Um, a negative test, on the other hand, is useful actually in a patient with toxoplasmosis. Again, as I was saying, 50% um, of the patients that present with acute non-granulomous anterior uveitis will be HLA B27 positive. So that is a useful screening test for that entity especially since between 33 and 83% of those patients will have an undiagnosed either um, uh, axial or non-axial uh, spondylarthropathy. So you can be, as an ophthalmologist, the person that identifies a systemic disease, and I, I query the patient as to their symptoms, and if they have any symptoms, we send them off to rheumatology. ANA, likewise, is a very poor screening uh, test for all uveitis patients. Um, uh, ANA positivity is useful uh, in, in a patient in whom you uh, um, suspect a diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, or in children that have uh, uh, anterior uveitis and joint disease as uh, oligoarticular uh, uveitis and ANA positivity, positivity confer high risk for disease. Beta, urinary beta-2 microglobulin uh, and serum creatinine are a good screening test for patients with simultaneous bilateral anterior uveitis uh, for the diagnosis of tubular interstitial nephritis and uveitis syndrome. And then uh, ANCA and rheumatoid factor and CCP are, are useful tests and are imperative uh, in patients uh, with scleritis-associated uh, disease as one wants to rule out small vessel uh, vasculitis, which can be associated with severe necrotizing retinitis and associated with uh, increased mortality in those patients. Just a word about sarcoidosis. Um, sarcoidosis can do anything it wants. Uh, as, you, as you know, we see a fair amount of sarcoidosis here, not in the typical population that is defined in the United States, which is an African-American population, but more in the Scandinavian population. So we see a lot more acute uh, sarcoidosis. Um, ACE and lysozyme are, are typically ordered for uh, uh, patients with this, but they don't really have a uh, very uh, specific uh, predictive value in the diagnosis. If they are very high, they are helpful in the correct clinical diagnosis, but they can be falsely uh, elevated, for example, in children that ha have high ACEs or falsely low in patients that are on ACE inhibitors. 
the most useful screening test for sarcoidosis is a chest x-ray. Um, so bilateral hyalur adenopathy is a very useful screening test for uh, chest x-ray, and it is a, a presumptive uh, diagnostic uh, tool. So that would be probable sarcoidosis. In patients that have clinical signs of sarcoidosis and a negative chest x-ray, and you still have a suspicion of that, a chest x-ray is uh, also very useful. In fact, it's suggested that patients over the age of 40 that have signs of idiopathic uveitis um, be screened uh, and, and have um, are suspected of sarcoidosis, be screened with a CT scan as um, sarcoidosis can be diagnosed in a fairly high percentage of those patients. Again, uh, sarcoidosis is a tissue diagnosis. Um, you can obtain tissue from the lungs and the lymph nodes, but you know you can also look at the uh, skin. Uh, I, one can take a biopsy from the skin or a conjunctival nodule and make the diagnosis. Likewise, the lacrimal gland. You may be asked, you know, on your rounds, you know, to do a non-directed conjunctival biopsy for the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, but this has limited value. Ancillary imaging are employed frequently, including chest x-rays, sacroiliac films, PT, MR in patients with um, neurological disease or MS, uh, particularly immunocompromised patients with toxo. Uh, B-scan, including UBM, are very useful uh, modalities. You wouldn't want to have a surgical adventure in the uh, B-scan in the eye below. And then UBM is useful in patients with um, iritis associated with lens uh, dislocation or malposition, cyclic membrane cilia uh, detachment, uh, and in trying to discern or, uh, the differential diagnosis of the white patient's hypotenuse, which is a super vexing problem in uveitis. We utilize full field and multifocal ERGs, visual fields, particularly in patients with, with birdshot and in patients with um, other more uncommon diseases such as Azor or uh, immune, autoimmune associated uveitis. Um, we frequently will, in patients with posterior disease from intermediate uveitis to, uh, or those with uh, diseases of the retina choroid, employ multimodal imaging. Uh, fluorescein angiography is alive and well, I think, in the uveitis uh, world. Um, it is a very highly sensitive modality for the detection of vasculitis and hence disease activity. Uh, it, it's very useful in delineating areas of non-perfusion, uh, which may require uh, laser treatment. Uh, ICG angiography is probably employed much more often in uveitis than it is in retina, uh, particularly in patients with white dot syndromes as the uh, choroid is frequently uh, affected in these diseases. Um, OCT, as you know, has revolutionized our ability to follow patients um, in time and provide quantitative information uh, on macular edema, but also to discern whether or not the edema is mechanical or inflammatory. And then OCTA, I think, uh, will be, be much more uh, uh, helpful and uh, in my practice has been useful uh, in uh, determining whether or not um, patients have vascularized uh, lesions in the back of their eye, um, associated with multifocal choroiditis or PIC, which we know are associated with a high prevalence of chromium vascularization. And then finally, fundus autofluorescence uh, is a useful tool, particularly in diseases involving the choroid and pigment epithelium, such as the white dot syndromes. Um, it is a way of non-invasively following patients uh, to detect expansion of atrophy in areas where the autofluorescence is black or where there is hyper autofluorescence uh, in which it is thought that this represents activity in areas uh, of, uh, in patients with uh, multifocal choroiditis or, uh, or inflammatory uh, diseases affecting the pigment epithelium. In retina and in uh, uveitis, pattern recognition is, is important, but as you can see here, things aren't always what they appear to be. Seeing things as they really are is a real trick in life, if not, uh, in retina or in uveitis. So when confronted with a patient like this, is this a non-infectious vitritis? Is it a necrotizing retinitis? Or are we dealing with a intraocular neoplasm? So in cases like this, you know, and in particularly in, if the patient is immunocompromised, it is really difficult to tell just based on what you're seeing, what you're dealing with. So 
in uveitis of unknown etiology, particularly when the presentation is insufficient to make the diagnosis, the present or it's atypical, um, or you have treated the patient and had a, a, um, a response to therapy that is kind of um, either inadequate or atypical, or they get worse, one needs to rethink your diagnosis and uh, suspect an intraocular infection or malignancy. So biopsy really has the opportunity uh, to um, change the management of your um, of your patient and affect their systemic health. And really the techniques that we employ, as we will discuss later in uh, other lectures, including anterior chamber paracentesis in eyes for uh, with uh, necrotizing retinitis, when that is really the only, when the differential diagnosis is narrow, when the differential diagnosis is much broader in which you have to consider bacterial and uh, fungal uh, infections, a uh, three-port uh, vitrectomy is, is much more uh, uh, useful in that it allows larger volumes, uh, dilute and undilute specimens, and more controlled removal of the vitreous. Um, one can also, I think it performs a therapeutic function uh, in calming the eyes down in some, some eyes and allows one also to perform retinocortical bi biopsy. So, um, what is the key if it's infectious, non infectious, or neoplastic? Really, I think before you stick a needle in anything, an accurate and thorough history, uh, complete examination, and, and, and what is the appropriate clinical context, and then employ the laboratory and invasive testing to confirm your diagnosis. Um, so, that, that I think is a really key uh, philosophical approach to uveitis. So, just on to treatment. Um, the I just want to kind of review a therapeutic approach to patients with non-infectious uveitis and give you some, some data on, you know, where we're at with that. The appropriate use of local and systemic corticosteroids as initial and adjunctive therapy, the indications and complications and long-term benefits of immunomodulation used initially or as steroid sparing, and then give you some idea of the new biological therapies and uh, therapeutic delivery systems that we are currently using or that are going to be in the clinic shortly. So as, we, as we've said, the most important uh, aspect of treatment is to establish a diagnosis, right? So you don't want to treat an infection with steroids. You want to know what the anatomic location that will determine what you're going to be treating with, rule out infection malignancy uh, based on, and then the pattern of the inflammation. So we want to treat an infection with antimicrobial therapy, employ uh, aggressive and, but appropriately staged anti-inflammatory treatment in a step ladder fashion for non-infectious diseases. Um, we want to employ immunomodulatory therapy at the outset for disease-specific treatments for those entities that require it, and always be willing to take three or four steps back and reconsider your diagnosis if you have an atypical response to treatment or if new findings emerge. So every examination is an opportunity for a new diagnosis. So this step ladder algorithm consists of first corticosteroids by uh, whatever means is necessary and depending upon the um, anatomic location of the, uh, of, of the inflammation from topical periocular to systemic steroids then a low threshold for the employment of immuno, immunomodulatory therapy, either as first line or as uh, steroid sparing therapy using conventional or biological agents. And I'm not going to get into therapeutic vitrectomy, but this may be a modality that is employed later. So basically, we want to eliminate inflammation, treat and reduce and prevent structural damage that limit vision, improve function, and avoid in systemic uh, and potential uh, complications, ocular and systemic complications. So you want to cake and eat it. And I think in a lot of cases, we can, we can do that. So the route and choice of medication is really determined by location, the laterality, the severity, and the complications and, of the inflammation and the systemic health of the patients. So that topical steroids are usually sufficient for anterior uveitis, except in children with JIA. And then periocular intravitreal systemic corticosteroids with or without immunomodulatory therapy can be employed for um, 
the rest of those diseases in the back of the eye. A word about topical steroids, uh, there are a bunch of things that we can use, uh, prednisone, di uh, durazol. The idea is to start off, if you have inflammation that's one plus or greater with a high frequency, you know, QID to every two hours, uh, and then taper, um, keep them on a high dose of steroid, uh, st a frequency of steroids until they turn the corner and then begin tapering them. Cycloplege them to, for pain management and to move the pupil. I prefer cyclopentylate to move the pupil rather than atropine, which keeps the pupil in a fixed dilated position. I think may be associated with more frequent um, association with uh, posterior sneakia. And you can stop cyclopegia once the inflammation has gone down to zero. Local steroids are very useful in acute remitting non-infectious intermediate posterior and pancreatitis rather than chronic diseases. So we use them prim as primary treatment or as adjunctive therapy in patients that are on systemic treatment. It is frequently more often employed in patients with unilateral rather than bilateral disease to avoid bilateral injection and most often associated with um, uveitic macular edema. Um, contraindications, of course, would include uh, any infectious uveitis. You can't take a depot out of the eye once it's in there. Scleritis is a relative contraindication. There are cases in which subconjunctival steroids are very effective in non-necrotizing scleritic steroids. And then one needs to be cognizant as to whether or not this patient is a steroid responder or not and be willing to and be ready to treat it. So there are a couple of routes. We can perform a periocular steroid injection, either as a subtenons injection or an orbital floor injection, which has been shown to have good effect on the uh, resolution of inflammation and macular edema. And, uh, uh, and um, there is little tachyphylaxis to that, so there are repeated uh, uh, injections can be useful. We can inject it into the eye which uh, also is effective in treating uh, macular edema, improving vision and deritis and uh, botrytis, as well as um, I, no tachyphylaxis with the repeated injection, but uh, a, greater, uh, um, a greater percentage of ocular complications such as um, elevated intraocular pressure and cataract. We have the um, Osrodex, uh, or a dexamethasone delivery system, which has shown improvement of visual acuity, uh, vitreous haze, and macular edema um, in both adults and in children. Uh, it uh, is equally effective in vitrectomized and non-vitrectomized eyes. It may be actually preferable in a vitrectomized eye as it's non-dispersive. Uh, uh, and uh, it is not as originally touted, is associated actually with cataract formation and elevation intraocular pressure upon repeated exposure as one might expect. Um, just a word about uveitic macular edema. It is the most common, it affects all subtypes of uveitis and is the leading cause of visual impairment in patients with uveitis in about 40% of the time. And in the um, MUST trial, which I, I gave you guys to read, you know, 40% of patients still had persistent or unresolved macular edema at two years. And uh, about two thirds of them that were assigned to the systemic arm required at least one adjunctive corticosteroid injection. So there's this need to treat macular edema and usually it is treated with um, periocular injection. So the, the principles for treating macular edema are to control the underlying inflammation or infectious disease. And then persistent or recurrent edema is usually treated adjunctively either with regional or regional corticosteroids for unilateral disease or systemic corticosteroids sometimes in patients with bilateral disease, and then modification of risk factors that we know are associated with this complication, such as smoking. So taken together, it seems that intraocular injections, intravitreal injections, may be more effective uh, than periocular injections uh, and may be associated with uh, more uh, elevated intraocular pressure and cataract. There is additional benefit with repeated injection and a lower relapse rate with macular edema in patients that are on concomitant systemic therapy. So this was actually studied in a, a trial that was published last year 
that we were a part of called the point trial. And this compared the best initial treatment, whether it be periocular, intravitreal, or Ozodex, for patients with either active or inactive uveitic macular edema. And to make a long story short, it showed that all treatment groups did improve in terms of central macular thickness and best corrected visual acuity, but both intravitreal approaches, that is intravitreal triamcinolone and dexamethasone with the Ozodex, were superior to the periocular injection in terms of improving and resolving macular edema. There was a modest in, increase in intraocular pressure, which was greater in the intravitreal than periocular group. Um, and the intravitreal implant was not inferior to intravitreal triamcinol. In fact, um, it may be, there was a signal that was not statistically significant that showed that it may be actually a little bit better. So it, all in all, it seems that if you have a patient with severe central involving macular edema, then an intravitreal approach is probably the better way to go. There are exceptions. Um, the problem with regional corticosteroids um, is that you have the cumulative risk of uh, cataract, uh, of uh, interactive pressure, and then endophthalmitis. They're relatively short acting and less effective for chronic inflammation. So an attempt has been made to come up with sustained delivery systems such as the Redisert, which, which is surgically implanted into the back of the eye uh, in the operating room, which delivers uh, flucilone into the eye for two and a half years and is associated as one would expect by marinating an eye in steroids for two and a half years uh, of a high incidence of cataract, uh, elevated intraocular pressure, and um, the need for incisional um, glaucoma surgery in 40% of patients. An alternative to this is an office-based flucinolone in acetonide insert, which has been approved by the uh, FTA or UTIC. Um, this has been shown in clinical trials to have significantly lower recurrence rates and improve visual acuity with less adjunctive systemic treatment, but a higher risk of cataract surgery and elevation of intraocular pressure. This is 12 month data and there is now three year data available, which I think I, um, I sent to you, at least the one year data. In terms of macular edema, there is pretty good resolution of macular edema in some eyes. Uh, uh, who undergo UT versus sham. So I anticipate that the major use of this will be as adjunctive therapy uh, in eyes with um, persistent macular edema, although this, that is not the, mar the labeled indication for that. An alternative delivery system, which I think will become available is a supracroidal delivery of triamcinolone uh, into the eye, which was studied in the peach tree trial in which uh, supracroidal triamcinolone was delivered at day zero and week 12 versus, quote, sham. These patients, of course, were treated with, uh, uh, with steroids uh, based on uh, certain eligibility criteria. But uh, the final endpoint uh, in terms of uh, improvement of best corrected visual acuity by three lines was obtained in uh, 47 versus 16% versus of sham eyes. And there was really a robust decrease in central macular thickness um, after one injection, which was noted by four weeks in the uh, CLSTA treated arm. Just so you know, intraocular methotrexate has been employed not only in the use of uh, uh, patients with intraocular lymphoma, but in patients with uveitis and in macular edema, showing decrease in uveitis and decrease in central macular thickness at three and six month time points and improvement of visual acuity, which corresponds with those points. Likewise, intravitreal uh, anti-VEGF therapy, both with ranibizumab and bev bevacizumab have been used in small pilot studies, which have shown improvement in visual acuity and decrease in central macular thickness um, without any systemic side effects. There is currently an ongoing trial of which we are participating and we are, we are lead Vanguard clinic called the MERIT trial, which is looking at um, the uh, relative safety and efficacy of eyes with persistent or recurrent macular edema with controlled uveitis and comparing the Ozodex implant to non-steroidal alternatives of anti-VEGF in, in the form of uh, Lucentis and intravitreal methotrexate. So stay tuned for that. Corticosteroids have a very bad reputation but really are the centerpiece of treatment of severe disease. Uh, and when used, I think appropriately, can be extremely useful 
in putting out a fire. You certainly want to put out a fire with a fire hose rather than with a squirt gun. And I think that using prednisone uh, in an appropriate fashion uh, does that. Uh, usually we start out with a dose of a milligram per kilogram per day, usually around 60 milligrams, which has been shown to not be associated with a dreaded complication of aseptic necrosis of the femoral head. Um, and then therapy is then uh, kept at that level and then tapered depending upon the clinical response. One can also pulse it with IV methylprednisolone, as you know from the uh, uh, object nerve treatment trial. And one must always uh, keep in mind that uh, this, the many side effects of the steroids, including loss of calcium from the bones, particularly in postmenopausal women. So we uh, you know, keep patients honest by weighing them, uh, looking at their serum uh, glucose at baseline, and uh, fasting lipids annually and bone densitometry annually. You all read a paper on uh, the guidelines for the use of immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, that includes failure of systemic corticosteroids, unacceptable side effects of steroids, diseases known to be poorly responsive to steroids, or a requirement of systemic steroids for greater than three months of more than 7.5 milligrams per day because it is thought that chronic steroids, and it is known that chronic corticosteroids at 10 milligrams per day are associated with, at, in the long term, over 10 to 20 year period of cardiovascular side effects, whereas those doses at five milligrams are not. Um, in, in that paper, uh, there are certain disease entities which, in which immunomodulation was, it was thought to be, it was commenced at the onset of treatment no, because the natural history of those diseases are known to be poorly responsive to corticosteroid monotherapy. They include Bechet's disease, severe ocular mu mucous membrane pemphigoid, serpiginous, necrotizing sclerosis, sympathetic ophthalmia, and BKH. There are other diseases for which corticosteroids are the first line treatment, but immunomodulation may be begun very soon after the onset of the disease. May include patients such as birdshot, multifocal cordis, and panuveitis intermediate uveitis and JA-associated disease. So I like to think about immunomodulation in two large categories. There are the conventional small molecule therapies, and then there is um, the biologics. So in the con again, thinking in categories, the conventional treatments, we have anti-metabolites, including methotrexate, mycophenolate, and azathioprine, um, which I, um, inhibit DNA or RNA synthesis uh, by inhibiting uh, various uh, purine uh, uh, metabolites. There are the T cell transduction or calcineurin inhibit inhibitors such as uh, cyclosporin and tacrolimus. And then the alkylating agents such as chloramicillin and cyclophosphamide, which are used less frequently these days, given the um, side effects of these medications and the availability now of biological medications. So the treatment principles include acute care with steroids, using large enough doses soon enough to put out the fire, and then using steroids either systemically or, in, or as an injection as a bridge to allow uh, conventional intermittent modula modulation to take effect. It, you have to know the response time of these medications. So for the conventional small molecules, it takes two to three months for methotrexate and uh, uh, mycophenolate to become active. So as you were coming down on steroids, the um, uh, conventional agents should kick in. We want to monitor the patients for potential toxicity depending upon the drug and uh, have laboratory evaluations at baseline and regular intervals um, to monitor toxicity, including leukopenia and, and liver function tests and BUA and creatinine depending upon uh, the agent used. So for calcineurin inhibitors, uh, tacrolimus and cyclosporin, we would certainly check their BUN and creatinine. Just to give you an idea of the efficacy of single agent therapy, the site study, which was a very, which is an ongoing large uh, multi-centered retrospective study of five large uveitis practices in the United States showed that um, monotherapy with these medications is pretty good. Okay, but not you know curative. Okay, so about two thirds of the time, it, they are helpful, um, uh, are steroid sparing, 
and the uh, remission rate is terrible with the exception of patients with uh, cyclophosphamide. So we know that the alkylating agents can induce a remission in patients with severe disease. They are effective uh, in certain disease entities as has been shown by these studies here. I just put them up there to show you that particularly in JIA associated urocyclitis, they, single agent therapy can be associated with improvement in vision uh, and decrease risk of visual loss and complications in this cohort. Similarly, in patients with birdshot, multifocal, VKH, and serpiginous, uh, both conventional and cytotoxic agents uh, have been shown to be useful uh, for these agents. The MUST trial uh, was a uh, randomized controlled trial, which I, the literature of which I gave you guys to, to look over, which studied the uh, Redisert implant versus a standard protocol using these conventional agents. And the outcome at two years, which was the designated outcome for the study, showed that the visual outcome was similar for both groups, but that inflammatory control was achieved at a slightly faster degree uh, that with the implant than with systemic therapy. It also showed, contrary to the prevailing kind of um, bias, that systemic therapy was actually very well tolerated um, and that patients did very well on that and that as one might expect, there were many ocular complications, uh, including cataract surgery and the need for incisional glaucoma surgery with the, um, with the register. The MUST follow-up study at seven years also had a very interesting result in that by about five years, uh, there seemed to be kind of a switch, a crossover in these curves, so, such that by seven years, there was a uh, visual favor, uh, the, um, uh, the visual acuity uh, was better uh, by a significant degree in eyes or on systemic therapy than the Redisert implant. Um, and that uh, there was a mean loss of six letters in the implant group. And this was thought to be due to reactivation of uh, corneal retinal lesions. There was an incidence of, you know, uh, visual loss down to 2,200, 22% versus 13% in the uh, implant arm versus the systemic arm. We could debate this for a long time. Uh, but we won't right now, uh, because I think there's a role for both systemic therapy and the implant in uveitis. These graphs just show that uveitis activity uh, increases in the uh, implant arm, in the yellow, uh, in the yellow arm, uh, by about five years, and that uh, macular edema in the on the right was initially statistically significant only at about six months um, in the implant arm. Uh, and then that, uh, that advantage was lost at about five years. So I think the, the, we also know just as in two years that there was a high incidence of ocular complications, the implant versus systemic, and that there were very few systemic adverse outcomes in the systemic group, which is reassuring for people that treat patients with systemic disease. So that the, the um, long-term outcome favored systemic versus implant therapy, and that despite the fact they had superior initial control of the implant, uh, there were greater than expected, uh, uh, great, there were expected um, ocular side effects, but without systemic side effects. So what are the implications of that? The, the implications really depend upon the patient, okay, I think. We might want to start out with systemic therapy initially in patients, uh, uh, but there are going to certainly be patients uh, that either cannot tolerate uh, systemic therapy, cannot tolerate systemic corticosteroids, um, that will do better with the implant. The principle, I think, uh, and the lesson from this study more than anything is that continued sustained control of the inflammation is the key to good outcomes, whether or not you have an implant in the eye or you're uh, treating the patient with systemic therapy. Part of the problem with the implant therapy is that the implant, there was no uh, exchange of the implant that was mandated in the study past two years. So there may be a bias in, in these results, but one has to be willing to take the implant out or put another one in. So biological response modifiers are the new, uh, the other classification of drugs. They are the kind of um, revolution in our uh, treatment, but not a panacea. This is just a small list of some of the uh, um, 
biological agents that are being used in uveitis today. Uh, I attended a lecture last year in which Jim Rosenbaum said that there were over 200 biologic agents that were being studied uh, in various human diseases, which is mind boggling. But the ones that you will most likely encounter include the uh, TNF inhibitors, including infliximab, which is a chimeric monoclonal antibody to TNF. Uh, it is delivered by IV infusion. It's a chimeric chimera so that um, you can form antibodies to it. And so uh, methotrexate or some other uh, immunomodulator is usually administered with it. Adalimumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody against anti-TNF. It is delivered subcutaneously um, and has been approved by, uh, for uh, intermediate panuveitis and posterior uveitis in 2016. One can also form antibodies to adalimumab. There was an expert panel on the, on the uh, recommendations for the use of infliximab and adalimumab in which uh, Bechet's disease, it was uh, the overwhelming, sorry, majority was that the uh, that Bechet's disease should be uh, treated initially with an anti-TNF and that um, second line agent would be a failure of methotrexate or, uh, or a um, small molecule for JIA and then a potential second line uh, for uh, agents um, that fail anti-metabolite calcineurin inhibitor or IMT failure for severe posterior panuveitis. I distributed the visual one and visual two results. This, these were uh, pivotal um, randomized controlled clinical trials uh, for both active and inactive uveitis, which led to the approval of uh, Humira for the treatment of, uh, of non-infectious posterior uveitis. One of the most important developments, I think, in the treatment of uveitis. So what are the, what are the concerns? Um, well, uh, we know that uh, TNF inhibitors can lead to an increase in infections such as TB and histoplasmosis, so that all patients are screened with a PBD and chronic urine gold or an ELISA spot. There are reports of increased risk of lymphoma associated with these, these medications, depending upon the literature that you read, um, and increased risk of demyelination so that uh, anybody that has a history of multiple sclerosis or pars planitis, which we know is associated with about a 15% increase in the risk of um, demyelinating disease, uh, should have an MRI scan um, or should not, uh, uh, or if there are lesions on MRI scan, should not receive these medications. There is a variable response to anti TNF therapy. So uh, there are non responders, there are people who can develop antibodies and there are treatment-related side effects. So what are our options? Well, there are a bunch of other anti-TNF agents. Um, if a patient fails Humira, we might want to try infliximab because you have more, very, you have more flexibility with, with, in terms of the dosing of the medication. So you can go as high as 20 milligrams per kilogram. There are other um, anti-TNF medications that may be effective, um, uh, whereas adalimumab may not be. And then there are third line agents, which are currently being used, such as um, uh, Arencia or Bodicept, Rituximab, Anakinra, Sarolimumab, and Tocilizumab. Um, Rituximab, I just mentioned to you, is an anti CD20 uh, uh, monoclonal antibody. Interesting that it, it works on B cells, but actually is very effective in patients with refractory sclerosis and ocular inflammatory disease and in patients with, with uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid, and in some patients with refractory uveitis due to JIA. Interferons have been uh, interferon alpha 2A, and there's a wide experience with the use of this medication in, in the European experience for Bechet's disease, but not so much in the United States. Um, and it has been effective in the treatment of recalcitrant um, macular edema. Interferon, uh, Intravenous immunoglobulin has been also employed uh, in patients uh, with autoimmune type of disease. Emerging data on newer agents such as Actemra or tocilizumab, which is directed against the uh, cytokine anti uh, interleukin 6, shows that it has, in case series, have been shown benefit in patients with refractory uveitis due to JIA and Bechet's disease. And there have been two studies that have shown that it's been effective in patients with macular edema. So what about the risks, the systemic risks? Um, 
this is kind of old data and it needs to be updated, but it's not, not been published yet. And that we, pr we pretty much know that um, the anti-metabolites and T-cell inhibitors, at least in the site database, are not associated with increased risk of mortality or cancer uh, associated with the use of these medications. Um, the TNF inhibitors, at least in the site study, did suggest that there's increase of mortality and cancer mortality associated with TNF inhibitors, but it was a very small number of patients and subsequent data suggested that this is not the case, at least for ocular inflammatory disease. You should be aware that there is also an Australian study that did show a significantly increased risk of um, uh, a malignancy in patients treated with um, IMT, but it lumped all IMT together, including cyclophosphamide and chloramicil. And then we also know that there's a significantly increased risk for non-melanotics in cancer uh, in patients that take uh, medications such as mycophenolate and in every patient that lives in Australia. So that also may be a bias to that study. So to modify the prognosis, we have to have effective and sustained suppression of intraocular inflammation for the early introduction of steroid sparing, immunomodulatory therapy, or sustained implantable local therapy if one wants to accept the ocular side effects of that medication and indicate it for that patient. I think it's going to be key to identify surrogate markers for complications of visual loss um, and then vigilant post marketing surveillance of these new agents. And of course, you know, randomized controlled trials are really useful uh, to kind of inform our treatment decisions as has been uh, um, performed in uh, studies such as the MUST, the Point Merit and the peach tree trials. So I thought I would use the rest of the time to go over stuff that might be a little bit more interesting for you guys. Um, I hope that that provides a very broad overview and that the um, information that I provided for you supplements the material that I presented to you. In the past, you know, I've split this into two lectures. It's an awful, large amount of material, but it's a very broad brushstroke of, of the approach to the diagnosis and treatment of UBS that we will see on a case-by-case -case basis when we rotate in the clinic. Are there any specific questions about this that you, anybody would like to raise? Okay, so this is the audience participation trial time. Um, so you can unmute yourselves if you like. Um, so here we have a patient with anterior uveitis and macular edema. What is the anatomic location of this disease? Anterior, intermediate, posterior, perineal uveitis. Anybody? It's still just anterior. Yeah, anterior. And why is that? Because CME doesn't define posterior uveitis. You'd have to have retinal like vasculitic or choroidal involvement. Excellent. That's very good, Cole. I, you know, so structural complications such as vasculitis, macular edema, or optic nerve involvement are uh, do not um, denote uh, posterior involvement uh, that define posterior uveitis. That's precisely correct. So here we have a patient with anterior uveitis, some, a little bit of anterior uveitis, botrytis, macular edema, disc swelling, peripheral vascular sheathing, intermediate posterior pan uveitis. I think this is intermediate. Okay. But, well, I just don't see, see anterior, I see the botrytis but then the CME and disc swelling, and I think the vasculitis don't define it as posterior. Excellent, very good. How about this patient with anterior uveitis, focal retinal choroiditis, botrytis, and vasculitis, posterior uveitis or panuveitis? Sounds like panuveitis. Yeah, I think so, uh, that's exactly right. So toxoplasmosis uh, usually uh, can produce you know, is defined usually most often as a posterior uveitis, but it can produce a pan uveitis with granulomatous uh, inflammation in the anterior chamber. And uh, a very specific type of vasculitis called cheerolysis uh, arteriolitis, which have these very fine plaques on the arteries. 
Okay, so here's a 27-year-old um, white male presents to you on call, uh, pain, redness, photophobia, ciliary flush, recurrent episodes. This isn't the first time this has happened to him. He's got lower back pain. So what are you thinking diagnostically and how would you want to work this guy up? HLA-B27. Okay. So that would be the first thing, HLA-B27. So half the patients have HLA-B27 and they don't have arthritis. Do you think you want to, well, I think this patient may also need a referral to rheumatology or something? Do you get the max risk first, I guess? Okay, so the differential diagnosis of anterior uveitis, you're right. B27 associated disease in about 50%. Repetic lens induced bachettes, drug induced. TINU, trauma, idiopathic. You want to ask the patient about back pain, oral and genital ulcers, right, and Bechet's disease, skin lesions, arthralgias. Uh, there's a low percentage of patients with B27-associated disease that may have inflammatory bowel disease, so you might want to ask them that, and then, of course, medication use. You definitely want to get an HLA B27 on, a, on this type of patient. Sacroiliac as opposed to lumbosacral films and in a patient that might have bilateral simultaneous disease, 82 microglobulin is a good screening test um, for uh, TINU. I always investigate patients for syphilis. So how are we gonna treat this guy? First episode, anterior uveitis. Most of the time, intensive topical steroids work. 90% of the time, about 11% of patients with B27 associated disease can become chronic. I think the importance of referring the patient to um, a rheumatologist, uh, particularly if they are symptomatic, is that at least in you know a more recent paper, 80 some uh, 82% of patients had either axial or non-axial, uh, you know, joint involvement um, that were uh, with uh, anterior uveitis. If they're HLA B27 positive, their chances of having uh, ankylosing spondylitis are high, and there is disease-modifying hematic treatment available to that patient so that you don't end up with kyphosis at the age of 50. Okay, so you're on call, okay, and you're confronted with this. What are we looking at? Anybody? So there's a... Um... Definitely a hypopion, and then also just looks like, at least in the picture on the left, there's a little bit of uh, maybe AC cell and inflammation and okay. a lot of injection as well. Okay, and what about on the right? Is there anything else in that hypopion? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, there's a, to me, I think there's a little bit of blood in there too. Okay, gotcha. in the very bottom of it. Gotcha. Okay, so what are you thinking about, I, you know, I, in terms of I, differential diagnosis of, of hypopion uveitis? Right, highest in the differential would probably be Bichette's. That also, would be high in your, when, is that the first thing you think about? No. In, in I saw like City, Utah? HLA-B27. Okay, HLA-B27. I think Bichette's certainly is in the differential diagnosis, no question about it, but you would need to ask questions that would be appropriate to Bechet's disease, right? What is their ethnicity, their trout, where in the world are they from, oral, genital, ulcers, that kind of thing. What else can, and that what else this. would you be concerned about? You're on call, you wanna make sure, how are you gonna, dispose? what other questions are you gonna ask this patient? Do they use IV drugs? Do they have any fever, sepsis, factor? And so why would you ask them that question? Uh, Ariana said endophthalmitis. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, so endogenous endophthalmitis, right? So that would be endogenous endophthalmitis, right? IV drug abuse, uh, have they uh, had parenteral alimentation, right? Have they had a GI procedure recently? What, how else can you get this type of viritis if it's not endogenous? You can have exogenous endophthalmitis. You need to ask about like uh, ocular procedures that they've had, um, any kind of surgery. Yep. Yeah, sure. So postoperative, right? That's cataract surgery or the person on the left is pseudophagic, you know, 
So post-operative disease, what else, what else can give you uh, a hypopion? We don't see people. it here, but uh, what piece of history would you ask the patient? Something so, like uh, leukemia um, could give you something right. that looks like mm -hmm. Excellent. That's really, really good. Uh, so you can have a pseudo hypopion, okay, or a pink hypopion in patient with uh, AML, for example. Um, what else? Say this patient's a prisoner. You know, or tuberculosis, uh, or pugilist. You know, so trauma, right? I mean, trauma can give you a hypopion uveitis, can't it? Just, just saying. And we don't see that on the, on the, we don't see anything on the surface of the cornea, but can a cornea ulcer give you a, a hypopian uveitis? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or carotid uveitis. Or okay, so, so this is just, again, another list of stuff, okay? You mentioned many of them. Um, there are drugs that can give you a hypopian uveitis, such as rifibutin. One thing that someone that we didn't mention was lens-associated disease, right? Uh, intumescent lens, and then of course um, the uveitis, you know, uh, syphilis, brucellosis, HSV infection. Uh, we've seen patients with ARN with hypopion uveitis, and then uh, neoplastic disease. Um, I think Rachel mentioned, uh, you know, uh, neoplastic disease. Uh, Retinoblastoma in a child can give you a uh, hypopion, which you certainly don't want to put a needle in that eye. And then corneal disease. Okay. Here's a six-year-old female with chronic bilateral non-granulomous angiobiotis, a white eye, posterior subcoxular cataract, and oligoarticular arthritis. What do you? What comes to your mind? I would be concerned for GI. Yeah, GIA associated iridocyclase, exactly. So typically in a white eye, particularly if you see this, you have already have a structural complication. Uh, but many times these patients will also present with posterior sneaky, which in and of itself is a marker for the development of, uh, of further complications. So we would wanna screen this patient with ANA, see what the age of onset of the disease is, what is their duration. Other entities in the differential are listed here. We, want, we would want to order up an ANA on this patient, uh, possibly uh, ACE and lysozyme uh, and Lyme, depending upon their constitutional history, um, and a chest X-ray. So children can get, uh, can get anterior uveitis associated with sarcoidosis at a young age. So how would we treat this patient? So if they have, this patient looks like they've already been treated with steroids, right? Or they have uh, inflammation in the back of their eye, but more, more than likely this PSC is a steroid induced cataract. So here you have a very good case to work in conjunction with pediatric rheumatology to start this patient on immunomodulatory therapy to treat both their systemic disease and to spare their total exposure to steroids. Does that make sense to everybody? A resounding yes. Yes. Okay. Here we have a 20 year old female with floaters, uh, decreased vision, quiet AC, snowballs and snowbank, episodic paresthesias. They've got uh, macular edema, vasculitis. What broad category of uh, disease are we thinking about? Uh, intermediate uveitis. Good. Okay. So, intermediate uveitis. The uh, differential diagnosis of intermediate uveitis, you want to think of certain systemic conditions such as MS, sarcoid syphilis, or TB, or you know, if you're in a Lyme, Lyme endemic area, um, Lyme disease, uh, that have very different uh, treatment approaches and that can impact on the systemic health of the patient, right? Once you have excluded uh, systemic or infectious entities, if uh, then this becomes an idiopathic diagnosis. Um, so pars planitis is a subset of intermediate uveitis, which is idiopathic disease. Okay, so they're not synonymous. Right. Are we clear on that? 
Yes. So intrabeta uveitis is a is a anatomic, uh, you know, designation, which can be due to idiopathic disease or associated systemic or infectious diseases. Um, whereas pars planitis usually has a pars planus snowbank, but not always, and is usually associated with uh, intermediate uveitis. There are some uncommon causes as are listed here. So the workup, we want to exclude syphilis, sarcoid, TB, Lyme serology where appropriate, and then consider a neurologic workup, particularly in a young woman, you would question the patient about you know, signs and symptoms of MS, right? So tingling, paresthesias, bladder, bowel incontinence, or meets sign. Um, I personally do not order uh, MRI scans on every single patient, every young woman with uh, uh, intermediate uveitis, but if there is any indication that they have any symptomatic disease, I would refer them to neurology and suggest that they uh, scan the patient, and I would avoid TNF inhibition. In, in such a patient until they knew that they had nothing going on in, the, in their white matter. Um, wide field fluorescein angiography is extremely useful in kind of delineating um, the extent of disease. There are going to be patients that do have um, uh, little areas of uh, retinal uh, vascular staining and sheathing in their, uh, and leakage in their periphery. If they're 20, 20 and no macular edema, I would watch those patients, but the truth be told, we really don't know what the long-term history of that entity is. So the treatment options for a patient like this, if it were uniocular, would be periocular intravitreal corticosteroids, right? Systemic steroids with or without immunomodulatory therapy, an implant or an insert, and in some, some patients, maybe a therapeutic vitrectomy. Okay, so here are some diagnoses we, we definitely don't wanna miss you know, when you're on call, okay? So I'm just gonna kind of run through some of these things. I'm sure that many of you know about them, and if you don't, that's okay. But I uh, just um, shout, shout it out. You got this African male with, a, what, do we, what do you see in there? Somebody. Um, I see vitreous and also possibly, I can't tell, maybe a snowball. Sorry, the image is fuzzy for me. It looks like there's, there's a kind of like a choreal retinal lesion, uh, some a hypopigmentation, maybe some uh, vitreous haze as well, almost like a, a headlight and fog, maybe, lesion. Yeah, I, I would say so. So would you say that the lesion itself is well-defined or did, are the borders fuzzy? Uh, it looks like it could be well-defined, but maybe just looks a little bit fuzzy because of the media. Yeah, I'd say it's a little fuzzy. What about the vessels around there? It's a little subtle, but you see a little vasculitis associated with that? Mm hmm Okay, so I think your description is apt. I, I would call that a focal retinitis or a focal retinochoroiditis. So immediately, you know, a diagnosis comes to your mind, right? Could be a, a number of things. And these are the same diagnosis, okay? So in the upper right, you have a satellite lesion associated with a old corderental scar of toxoplasmosis. In the right, you have disseminated toxoplasmosis in a immunocompromised patient and his autopsy showing a ring enhancing lesion in his brain in, a, in an HIV patient. And then in the bottom left, you have a focal Retino, retinitis, retinocorditis, it turned out to be toxoplasmosis in a patient with acquired toxoplasmosis. So the differential, toxo, toxicoriasis, TB sarcoid syphilis, could be a necrotizing hepatic retinitis or focal bacterial fungal or endogenous endophthalmitis. So these are kind of the, how you would start thinking about these things and, and work the patient up. So this particular patient had a very high IgG, which is certainly not diagnostic. If this patient had like no insurance and no money, I would call this, you know, probably a focal retinitis and uh, make a diagnosis of toxoplasmosis. It's a clinical diagnosis, okay? A negative, negative serology is useful in that it rules out the diagnosis, 
Um, but a, and a very high IgG might suggest it. Uh, but an intermediate level is not so helpful as many people are exposed to toxoplasmosis. And then of course, the presence of IgM or IgA uh, are indicative of acquired disease in adult or congenital disease in infant. You can put in atypical cases, we particularly, we will perform a PCR amplification of either the, of the aqueous or vitreous, uh, which can be useful in the differential diagnosis. In terms of treatment indications, um, you know, we're a uveitis service, so most of the time we treat these patients, but uh, the natural history of it is to resolve in time, and that so small active peripheral lesions may be observed, only if you can observe them closely. In my experience, patients with toxoplasmosis um, are not exactly the most uh, likely patients to return to their follow-up appointments sometimes, so I might treat them. But treatment is certainly recommended for, for lesions that are anatomically abutting visually uh, threatening structures like the macular optic nerve that are producing vi visually significant vitritis, and it's certainly in an immunocompromised host. The classic treatment regimen is a pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, and folinic acid, uh, and corticosteroids in some cases at a reduced dose, usually at 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, after the institution of antimicrobial therapy, um, if there is significant botrytis associated with this. This is the classical regimen. As you know, pyrimethamine is exorbitantly expensive and difficult to obtain these days. One can use clindamycin in addition to that therapy or uh, alone, some people use it alone, uh, more commonly, people will use Bactrim, uh, particularly in a peripheral lesion that's not threatening the optic nerve or macula. Uh, clindamycin can be added for lesions to the posterior pole. What I, I have found that azithromycin and um, mepron or atovaquone are very useful uh, antibiotics with or without pyrimethamine uh, for, the, for treatment of, so azithromycin with or without pyrimethamine, but can be used uh, alone and atovaquone which I am told tastes terrible, although I've never tasted it myself. So there are cases in which I would perform an intravitreal injection of clindamycin, particularly if you had a lesion that was very close to the fovea and I wanted to get medication into the eye as rapidly as possible and I was unsure if the patient would be able to obtain a prescription for you know, azithromycin. And that can be delivered with or without dexamethasone. It's also useful in patients, say, for example, that are pregnant, who, uh, uh, in which many of these medications would be contraindicated. Here's another case presentation uh, that you don't want to miss. And uh, this was actually the eye of a patient I saw yesterday. Uh, and um, I've known this guy for a very long period of time. He was a really nice guy that um, kind of a world traveler. Uh, and was actually in Myanmar and uh, was referred to me with a branch vein occlusion. Because, and uh, in this picture, there isn't anything super, unre super remarkable other than I think a little bit of kind of brown glass appearance in his temporal macula. But 24 hours later, what are you, what are you guys looking at here? Reduction in vision. Where, what is the location of this disease? Can someone describe to me what they're seeing? Catherine. Um, yes, it looks like that there's definitely some more, uh, um, more haziness of the media, um, maybe some vitreous uh, cell, or sorry, vitreous haze. And then there's also some uh, punctate scattered um, chorioretinal whitening, as well as some scattered kind of blot hemorrhages as well, or just like punctate hemorrhages. The so retinal whitening and hemorrhages is what I'm seeing. So retinal whitening, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, there's vasculitis. All of the things that you're saying is, are, are true, okay? Medius hazier, uh, there are these punctate areas. There's vasculitis in the top infratemporal, uh, you know, artery there, and then in the bottom frame, there's retinitis, right? Because it's 
obscuring the retinal vessels, making them stand out in relief. So whenever you see retinitis like this in a otherwise immunocombinant or immunosuppressed patients, what, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about a, a non-infectious uveitis you can sit on for a while, or is this more of an ocular emergency? No, I think because of the acute onset and the fact that you said that he is not immunocompromised, I'd be worried about uh, porn. Okay. Um, well, you know, I don't know what porn is, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> but, um, you know, so porn actually is, is a specific diagnosis in patients with AIDS uh, and that are very, very immunocompromised. Um, right. I mean, are, I'm sorry. Okay. Are. But, right. So, a necrotizing retinitis. Yes. So, it, I just want to make sure that everybody on the call knows that if you see retinal whitening like this, think that that needs to go through your mind, okay? Because as you can see in 24 hours, this has progressed rapidly, okay? So at the time, he did have a actually broad differential diagnosis based on his travel history. He was also on Enbrel. Um, and so I performed a vitrectomy on this patient, which was positive for varicella confirming the diagnosis of a necrotizing herpetic retinitis. So acute retinal necrosis is something you want to think about when you see retinal whitening. Okay, initially described in 71, uh, it presents just like this with, in the periphery with these areas uh, unilaterally in about two thirds of the time with these areas of retinal whitening. This is an even better example of these multiple areas of retinal whitening and retinal hemorrhages that have been described as thumbprints in the retinal periphery. There is a occlusive vasculitis that is associated with this and vitritis is associated with this 100% of the time. So ARN is a clinical diagnosis, okay? You should suspect this diagnosis by your examination, okay? The, the natural history of this is to rapidly spread from the periphery to the posterior pole uh, and leaving a wake of destruction uh, in its, uh, in its path and a very high incidence of combined uh, regmatogenous and tractional retinal detachment. One, if one is sure that this is, if your differential is low uh, and you think this is on an AC tap is very useful in confirming the diagnosis, but one does not wait until the result of the PCR to come back or, or the vitreous to come back. One institutes empiric therapy immediately, okay? Conventional therapy used to uh, include IV, acyclovir. Uh, uh, however, um, and I would reserve IV acyclovir for patients that are immunocompromised or patients that have um, any type of neurologic uh, signs or symptoms because that can kill people. But um, an alternative regimen that we use frequently is to use uh, um, val acyclovir or valtrex at two grams three times a day which achieves similar concentration of the blood as IV, um, plus intravitreal therapy with antiviral agents. Um, aspirin is also frequently uh, uh, prescribed uh, because uh, of the occlusive vasculitis. And then following uh, maybe 24 hours after or concomitant with uh, antiviral therapy, prednisone uh, under antiviral cover because once you uh, have the infection under control, what really kills the eye is the inflammation associated with it. As I said, retinal detachment is highly associated with it once there's a view. Personally, I think that there is a role for prophylactic barrier laser photo photocoagulation. Um, and that's all I'll say about ARN. Okay, so please have ARN in your mind when you are on call and you think about it. I'm gonna run through this pretty quickly. Uh, this is something that you may not see very often. This is a 40 year old African female immigrant. Okay, so right away, you know, this patient is, you know, in a different category than your, um, you know, uh, housewife from Provo that presents to your clinic, right? So no fever, weight loss, but she was BCG immunized as a child and a PPD of 15 millimeters with this multifocal choroiditis. So you're thinking maybe this patient has um, TB. This is an example of a tuberculoma associated with uh, tuberculous uveitis. 
And I just want to show you that TB, hypersensitivity reaction, TB can be associated with a multifocal choroiditis uh, that you see here. So every patient with a multifocal choroiditis gets tested for TB. There's a disease that you probably don't see very often that was initially described in young, healthy Indian men called Eels disease, which is also a retinal vasculitis, an occlusive retinal vasculitis that's associated with tuberculin hypersensitivity disease. So in many cases, it's a presumptive diagnosis uh, because you 50% of the time you will have no uh, pulmonary uh, uh, disease. Uh, and uh, you know, um, quantifurin gold is useful uh, in detecting latent disease, but not active disease. And sometimes, um, you know, the diagnosis is made basically on a clinical and exposure history and the chest x-ray in consultant, consultation with ID. It can be really tough, but I think that patients, for example, with that disease, okay, uh, need to be on quadruple therapy, okay? Person with this disease, needs to be on quadruple therapy. A patient um, that is quantifurin gold positive, okay, uh, that has no other indications or, uh, um, or evidence on chest x-ray uh, would be regarded as, you know, kind of a converter. And if you're consider considering putting this patient on adalimumab, for example, they would need to be treated with, with um, at least two agents. Okay, so here's another diagnosis you don't want to miss. So Casanova, Idi Amin, Beethoven, I, and I, Nietzsche, and at least in my clinic, the church lady, all share something in common. Can someone tell me what that might be? It's the... Bichette's? I said it's the sif. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the sif, yeah. Okay, syphilis, exactly. So. Syphilis can do anything at once. It, you know, it, it seems kind of basic to go over this, but it's always presented at conferences and it, and it always surprises people when it turns out that it's syphilis. But it shouldn't because every patient should be tested for it and should always suspect syphilis. Okay, as I said, it can do anything, but most of the time it presents as a posterior uveitis. And I just want to kind of make you aware of uh, two different presentations that are very characteristic of syphilis. One is acute syphilitic posterior placoid quarter retinitis that you can see here in this 42-year-old guy with a uh, high risk sexual activity, history of IVDA and previously HIV negative. You can see this placoid lesion in his uh, left eye um, and the angiogram showing blockage in the area with late standing of that lesion. That, that is syphilis until proven otherwise given his history. So this is, you know, taking the clinical history and the morphology together, that's placoid syphilis. The, I, the um, OCT is extremely helpful, actually, in placoid syphilis in showing these irregular nodular hyperreflectivities of the RPE um, and sometimes subretinal fluid and loss of the ELM in some cases. And that goes away with treatment. The other presentation is a pan uveitis with superficial retinal precipitates of these small crummy migratory lesions that don't leave big scars in the retina, differentiating that from necrotizing retinitis. So here are two examples of both of an HIV positive and an HIV negative patient with this uh, syphilitic um, uh, superficial retinal infiltrates, and some of which, some of whom also, which I don't have a slide of, can, can have a multifocal type of choroiditis. Um, the history is important. Here's a 57-year-old guy that was referred from uh, neuro uh, with uh, blurred vision uh, and, you know, some uh, on his, when I took a history on him, sores on his hands and his mouth and his tongue, his RPR and FTA were positive. He had syphilis involving only his optic nerve. We did, we talked about some of the testing for syphilis. Um, you know, these days we usually screen patients with, um, an EIA um, and RPR to, uh, to confirm it with the, the TPPA as a um, tiebreaker. Um, the uh, thing to remember about syphilis is that obviously it's a sexually transmitted diseases. Everybody who is alive is at risk for developing this disease. And particularly 
uh, HIV and syphilis kind of co-migrate. Okay, so if the patient has syphilis, test them for HIV and vice versa. Um, the CDC does recommend a CSF evaluation for patients at presentation uh, for syphilis and then six months afterwards until the cell count is normal. The thing about the treatment of syphilis that is critical is that you don't give them you know, a shot in the butt with benzathine penicillin. It is considered neurosyphilitic disease and needs to be treated with um, intravenous IV penicillin at, at neurological doses. One more case, and I'll let you guys go. Um, this is a lady, uh, that 57-year-old woman with kind of a blunted affect who was referred to me with this progressive subretinal infiltration, unresponsive to corticosteroids, um, and I really had no family history um, and had some weight loss. So right there, there are a couple of things that tip you off as to something atypical happening in this patient, right? She's got some something funny going on in her head, right? Progressive subretinal infiltration, not responsive to your usual treatment. And this is what it looked like. These large areas of subretinal and subretinal pigment epithelial uh, infiltration, bad vision in one eye, not so great vision in the, in the other eye, and vitritis, okay, uh, which was asymmetric in haze. So what kind of things are you thinking about? He, this patient was referred in with an, a, a diagnosis of endo, endogenous endophthalmitis, but I was thinking of something a little bit different. <clears throat> Anybody? I think malignancy should be on the differential here. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, like malignancy should be on our differential probably? Yeah, for sure. What kind of malignancy would you be worried about? Some sort of like a, maybe like a CNS uh, lymphoma if we're thinking it's affecting the brain. Yeah. So it's precisely what was number one on our differential diagnosis, primary intraocular lymphoma or primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. And then of course, you know, leukemic infiltration, METs, um, and then other uh, non-infectious or infectious diseases. And this patient um, actually had a vitreous biopsy and a subretinal aspiration. And uh, her uh, cytology indeed showed, um, you know, uh, uh, malignant uh, cells, poorly differentiated malignant ne neoplasm, and her molecular uh, testing for Ig heavy gene rearrangement was positive for a monoclonal B cell population. So always think about you know a a a, 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 a neoplastic masquerade in your differential diagnosis. Um, I'm going to stop there. I, I have test questions, but you're probably you know you'll get them in your OCAP review. I I'm open to any questions. Uh, I hope that the uh, kind of broad brushstroke and the kind of illustrative cases were helpful and willing to answer any questions at any time.